Okay, so uh, uh, last time we were looking at examples of uh, uh, systems with linear uh, velocity constraints. And we were interested in uh, determining when uh, these systems were integrable. And so remember that integrable, you should interpret as being the condition that um, uh, the velocity constraint actually is not a constraint on velocity, uh, but actually can be integrated. That's why it's called integrable. Uh, uh, it can be integrated to give you a constraint on uh, configuration. Okay? And so then, uh, <clears throat> Um, so last time, and, and the example, the simple example last time was kind of too simple to really illustrate what to do. Uh, but in that case, uh, you're able to uh, uh, very easily argue uh, that that linear velocity constraint for the disk rolling in a, a straight line um, is integrable. Okay, and we kind of knew that from the physics anyway. Um, all right, so now let's look at. Uh, um, the slightly more complicated example. Um, and so remember to check whether something is integrable, what you have to do is you have to uh, calculate um, Lie brackets, okay? Um, uh, because the condition for integrability um, last time, uh, the condition for uh, integrability was that this, um, the subspaces, which were um, uh, spanned by taking uh, the vector fields that uh, span your distribution. So in, that, in this example, that'll be these two vector fields, x1 and x2, and start just taking iterated Lie brackets of them. So you know, x1 um, uh, uh, with x2, and then x3 with that bracket, and then x4 with that bracket, and so on. And so doing that for... Um, um, are potentially uh, arbitrarily many finite uh, uh, um, iterations, okay? Um, okay, so this, uh, I, I, sh I didn't say this last time and I should have, um, this, this theorem that I wrote down last time, it's a very famous theorem and it's called uh, Frobenius's theorem. Okay. Um, all right, so now we're going to apply that uh, construction in this case. And so the thing that we need to calculate is uh, L of D, okay? All right, so let's calculate some brackets, all right? So we have uh, um, X1 with X2, okay? So first of all, you know, as we saw last time, because the Lie bracket is skew symmetric, uh, you know, you don't have to calculate X1 with itself. That's always going to be zero. Uh, and similarly, of course, for X2. So um, you only need to take brackets of uh, things that are different. Um, so in, that, in this case, this is the only possibility. Okay. Um, so remember what the formula is. Um, so the formula uh, uh, for the Lie bracket and coordinates, which we're going to use, is... Um, um, d uh, x two j by d q k x one k minus uh, d x one j by d q k x two k d by d q j. Okay, so that's the calculation that we're going to do. Um, and so, uh, so this is the first time we've calculated a Lie bracket. So let me just show show you how you do this. Um, uh, so this, of course, is just the you know Jacobian matrix of the vector field x two, right? So you just take a. This will be in uh, the components here are j and k, um, and uh, uh, it's just the uh, the Jacobian of the vector with the components of uh, um, x one or uh, x two. 
Okay. Um, and so uh, first, according to my uh, formula here, um, I take X2, okay, because X2 comes first. Um, uh, and then I uh, calculate the Jacobian matrix of X2, but that's actually very simple in this case because um, uh, uh, all the coefficients of uh, X2 are constant. You know, there's only one coefficient, all the other ones are zero, but even that non-zero coefficient is just one. Okay, so... Um, So I, I'm, I'm, you know, even though it's zero, I'm going to fill it in here, just like I said, because it's the first time we've done a Lie bracket calculation. Okay, and then you stick the components of uh, um, x1 here uh, as a vector. Okay, so there's x1, and you know you have to choose an order for the coordinates, and let me choose the order uh, x, y, theta, phi. Okay, so I'm going to put the x component, um, which is rho, cos, theta, the y component, which is rho, sine, theta, and then the uh, theta component, which is zero, and the phi component, which is one, okay? I mean, that's all gonna be zero, but like I said, I'll pretend like it's not. Okay, then um, I need to, according to the formula, uh, take the uh, uh, matrix of partial derivatives of the vector with these components, all right? Um, so, uh, uh, so I've decided that it's gonna be x, y, theta, Phi. So in the first row, I'm going to put the uh, 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 partial derivatives of the x component, which is that, okay, with respect to the coordinates. And of course, it's only a function of theta. Okay, so it's going to be uh, zero, zero, uh, minus rho sine theta, zero. Okay, uh, and then similarly in the second row, I'm going to put the partial derivatives um, of the second component, the y component, with respect to the coordinates. And again, it only depends on theta. So it's zero, zero, rho, cos, theta, zero. Um, the, the third row is going to go um, the uh, derivatives of the theta component, but there is no theta component, so those are all zero. And then in the last row goes the uh, uh, um, uh, the, the partial derivatives of the phi uh, component, but the phi component has the, the coefficient is one, so all those partial derivatives will be zero. Okay, then I multiply that by um, uh, the column vector whose components are the components of uh, x2. Okay, so that is zero, zero, one, zero. Okay, so is that calculation clear? All right, um, so when you just do the matrix vector multiplication here, uh, you get um, uh, that it's going to be, so rho sine theta, then uh, minus rho cos theta, zero, zero. Uh, sorry, uh, let's see, did I do that right? Uh, yes, I did, sorry, good, yeah, okay. All right. All right. So that's sort of the just the simple algebra that you need to do. Um, so notice that I did not write um, this. Okay. Um, I'm calculating this. Okay, but it's not equal to all this stuff um, because these aren't the right kinds of objects, right? This is a vector field, and these are matrices and vectors. So, um, but nevertheless, from that calculation, um, so I will. Uh, uh, therefore, just erase that because it's not true. Um, but nevertheless, from the calculation, um, I can pull out what the Lie bracket is, and it is um, x1, x2 is um, rho sine theta d by dx minus rho cosine theta uh, d by dy, uh, and that's it, right? The other two, so you know, uh, plus zero d by d theta plus zero d by d phi. Okay, so that's the first Lie bracket. All right, now, um, if it were the case that um, this Lie bracket of x1 with x2 were it was already in the span of x1 and x2, okay, uh, then I, would, I could stop, 
right? Uh, because then no matter how many more brackets I take, I'm not gonna leave uh, my, my linear velocity constraint D, okay? Um, so uh, let me just uh, um, pull these down here so I have them at my disposal. Okay, all right. Okay, so there's my uh, uh, three vector fields, okay? And what I wanna know um, is, is this vector field in the span of these two, right? And if it is, then I can stop and I can say that the linear velocity constraint is integrable, okay? Um, is that bracket vector field in the span of the other two? What do you think? Kind of easy to see by hand. Okay, let's take the, uh, um, I know I have one no there, so let's take the democratic way around this. Who says that it is in the span? Who says that it's not in the span? Okay, um, who doesn't care? Okay, well, the answer is no. And uh, the reason it's obvious is, for example, um, these guys have d by d theta and d by d phi components, and this does not, right? So there's no conceivable way that this is gonna be in the span of these two. Okay. All right. So therefore, I know right off the bat that my linear velocity constraint uh, uh, is not integrable. Okay. But let's actually calculate another Lie bracket. And I'm not going to do the calculation here. I'm just going to write the answer. Um, uh, so can also calculate. And we'll see why I did this in just a second. So you can go x2, x1 x2 equals, um, uh, so again, this is just a calculation, just like the one I did above. Um, okay, and you get that. Okay. All right, now, why did I do that? Um, well, the observation that you make here is um, these four vector fields, okay? So the four vector fields x1, x2, the Lie bracket of x1 and x2, and the Lie bracket of that with x2 are linearly independent. Okay, and by that I mean they're linearly independent when I evaluate them at each q in q. Okay, and you know you can you can. Um, uh, uh, calculate that, right? And the way you calculate that is clear. You have four vector fields. And so you want to know if those four vector fields in four, um, um, uh, four with four, yeah, sorry. Uh, are those both supposed to say D by DX? Oh, they're definitely not. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so I have four uh, vector fields. Um, you know, think of them as four vectors in R4, uh, the, you know, the coefficients of those vectors are functions of x, y, theta, and phi, but never mind. Um, uh, so to check linearly independent, linear independence of four vectors in R4, you just put them in the columns of a matrix and calculate its determinant. Um, and in this case, the determinant will be something involving rho squared plus or minus rho squared, so non-zero, okay? And so that allows you to conclude the linear independence. Okay. All right, good. Um, so let's just sort of cache that fact uh, for the moment. Um, so um, just since um, this Lie bracket, x1 and uh, x2, is not 
in the span of um, x1 and x2, okay, we know that the linear velocity constraint, which I call D, um, is not integrable. Okay. Um, so uh, um, if, <clears throat> all right, so, so, okay, so I know that. Um, okay, so, but, but is the fact that L D Q equals T Q Q, um, for every Q in Q um, useful. Okay, it didn't have to be that way, right? It could have been the case um, when I did these calculations, it could have been the case that this one was not in the span, okay? But then this one didn't give me anything extra, right? So it could have been the case that when I calculated that Lie bracket, okay, that that one was in the span of x1, x2, and the Lie bracket of x1 and x2, in which case L of D wouldn't be four-dimensional, it would be three-dimensional, okay? Now, you know, you might uh, speculate then uh, that although, if that were the case, that although the linear velocity constraint is not integrable, you still might speculate that there's going to be now a three-dimensional um, sub-manifold on which your uh, 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 um, physical motions must um, restrict, okay? And, and that's in fact the case. So let me state that sort of clearly, okay? Um, and so this is uh, some version of the uh, uh, orbit theorem. Oops. Okay. Um, and so, you know, just to give you some sort of idea of where we are in the history of the universe here. Um, Frobenius, I don't know exactly when Frobenius is, but something like the uh, 1880s, okay. Um, and this thing that I'm saying here, uh, this is uh, um, a, a bunch of people made contributions to this. Uh, um, Okay, including uh, Nagano and Sussman. And then this is, you know, late in the previous century. So this, this is, you know, already sort of touching upon things that are, you know, in sort of the mathematical spectrum of time, um, new. Okay, and so here's what the orbit theorem says. Okay. Um, uh, let, and I'm gonna state this in kind of mechanical language, although this is a purely uh, a differential geometric thing. Okay, so let D, uh, be a linear velocity constraint on um, some some uh, manifold Q, okay, um, uh, and for Q um, uh, in Q <clears throat> denote orb Q D. Okay, uh, so this is going to be um, gamma of one. Okay, so that doesn't really help us very much right now, but so let me tell you what gamma is. So gamma is uh, a curve on zero one into Q um, such that, uh, so first uh, of class, um, so, yeah, I, I, sorry, I have to be a little bit careful here. Um, that is piecewise continuous, sorry, piecewise uh, differential. Okay, and by piecewise differential, what I mean is that, you know, there's a partition of the uh, interval zero one into a finite number of sub intervals, and on each of those sub intervals, uh, gamma is differential. So it's like piecewise continuous, except piecewise differential. 
Okay, so gamma is piecewise differentiable and um, uh, gamma prime of T uh, is in D gamma of T um, for all T's where gamma prime exists. Okay, so the idea is, um, so let me, uh, I'll finish the theorem in a second, but so the idea is this, uh, is that I have a curve, um, gamma, which is gonna start at, oh, sorry, I forgot one more thing. Um, um, and it has to start at Q. All right, so gamma is gonna be some curve that starts at Q, okay? And it's piecewise differentiable, so um, it might look something like, uh, um, uh, this, okay, um, and so its derivatives fail to exist at at, at, at this point, um, and so Q is gamma of zero, okay, and I know that at every point along this curve that gamma prime satisfies the linear velocity constraint, okay, All right, um, okay, um, and I end up somewhere which is gamma of one. Okay, so in other words, the orbit is the set of points that I can reach from Q following curves that satisfy the linear velocity constraint. Okay, so if you want to think in terms of the physics um, of, say, the little disk uh, example here, okay, um, it would be physical motions of the disk. So when I say physical motions of the disk, I mean motions that satisfy the velocity constraint. Um, uh, it would be physical motions of the disk that start at some point. So in other words, you wanna ask, starting at some, some configuration, what are the set of other configurations that I can reach while satisfying the velocity constraint, okay? So that's what the orbit is. And you know, if, if you, um, you know, most of you, not all of you, but most of you have some kind of a background in control theory. So this kind of seems like a controllability question. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right. So that's the orbit. And so the, uh, um, uh, the orbit theorem tells you something about the tangent spaces of the orbit. Okay. So then one, if L D is a constant rank. Um, so let me say uh, smooth. So, sorry. If D is smooth and if L of D has constant rank, um, actually, no, so I'm sorry. Um, if D is smooth, okay, then this space, subspace, D Q prime um, is a subspace of the tangent space to the orbit. For all um, Q prime in the orbit. Okay. <clears throat> So, sorry, I apologize. I'm kind of making a, making more work out of this than I need to. So uh, then orb Q D is a submanifold. Okay. And okay, here's its here's its tangent spaces. Okay, so if D is smooth, then what I know is that the uh, orbit, the tangent spaces of the orbit contain uh, the subspaces which I get by taking all of these Lie brackets. Okay, now um, if D is real analytic. then um, it's not only contained in, but it's equal to. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. And so, in particular, if um, LD Q is equal to the entire tangent space, which was the case in the rolling disk example that we just looked at. Okay. Um, and if Q is connected, then um, orb Q um, equals Q uh, for all Q. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so that's the, uh, uh, the orbit theorem. So let me go through this because I kind of made a hash when I wrote it out. Okay. Um, all right, so I have the orbit. Okay, and again, the orbit um, is I take uh, all curves that are piecewise differentiable, start at Q, okay, and then I take the endpoints of those. And so the way, again, to think about the orbit is that I start at my point little Q, and I consider motions, uh, motions are just curves as we are, are quite comfortable with now. Uh, so they're motions that satisfy the linear velocity constraint. So I take all of the endpoints of all possible motions starting at Q, satisfying the uh, velocity constraint. That's what the orbit is, okay? And so um, the first statement then is that the orbit is a nice thing. It's not just some uh, uh, um, crazy looking thing. Um, it's a submanifold. And again, it's not quite a submanifold. It's almost a submanifold. It's what's called an immersed submanifold, but I'm not going to fuss about the distinction here. Okay. Um, but but it's very close to being a submanifold. Okay. Um, all right. So that's one thing that's already nice, right? So it tells you that if I start at a point, um, Q, uh, then the set of points that I can reach satisfying the linear velocity constraint is a submanifold. So that's already information. Okay. Um, and then uh, these two statements tell you something about the tangent spaces. Okay. So um, uh, if you're if D is smooth, um, then the tangent spaces are going to contain this uh, a subspace, which you get by calculating all these iterated brackets. Okay, um, and if it's real analytic, then the tangent spaces are actually going to be equal to that. Okay, um, and so uh, uh, what we can conclude from this for the rolling disk Oh, and I had this uh, connectedness assumption here. I mean, you have to have that. Um, what is can have you encountered the notion of connectedness um, in your previous life? Um, it sort of means it doesn't have disjoint components, right? Um, and it needs to be connected because if it's not connected, then there's not there's going to be points here and points here. Then there's going to be no curve that connects them. So you know, yeah, it has to be connected. Okay. Um, so example, um, and so uh, again, this uh, this thing. Okay, um, so because L D Q equals T Q Q for all Q in Q, that's what we calculated above, right? So we had the L D, uh, we took the brackets, um, we took the vector fields X1, X2, X bracket of X1 and X2, and then the bracket of X2, X1 and X2. Um, and that already uh, gave me uh, four vector fields that span all of TQ. So L of D can't get any bigger than that. So therefore those four vector fields, they define L of D, okay? And I saw that L of D is equal to the tangent space at every point, okay? And so therefore I can conclude that the orbit equals Q, okay? Because, you know, Q is R2 cross S1 cross S1, um, and that's connected. Okay, 
All right, so that's, I think, uh, uh, and the interesting thing here, I think, is that there's this kind of non-obvious conclusion that you can draw here, right? Uh, which is that uh, uh, by motions of the disk uh, uh, satisfying the linear velocity constraints, I can put the disk in any position that I want. It's not very surprising, I think. Um, you wouldn't be very surprised to learn that I could uh, uh, steer the disk to any other position Okay, with uh, any other orientation that I wanted, that wouldn't surprise you. Okay, uh, I think the thing that maybe is a little bit uh, less obvious is the fact that I can also do that um, while uh, specifying any possible roll angle that I like. Okay, that's maybe not quite so clear. All right, I mean, you can sort of by hand imagine how you can steer this thing around on the on the um, on the plane. It's not so easy to see by hand. Uh, how you can uh, steer it from uh, one XY position to another XY position with a certain spin angle and a certain roll angle, okay? But nevertheless, that's what this, these calculations show you is that you can do that. How actually calculating that is a different story, okay? All right. <clears throat> okay, good. All right, so that uh, sort of finishes uh, kind of the uh, kinematics of linear velocity constraints. Because so far I haven't really talked about any kind of dynamics. I've just talked about uh, velocities um, and configurations and the way linear velocity constraints uh, interact with those things, okay? But I haven't talked about anything to do with Ramanian metrics or levi civita connections or the equations of motion, right? Um, so I should do that, right? Okay, <clears throat> all right, so there's kind of two paths that you can choose here. Um, one is the uh, straightforward, but very messy path. Um, uh, and the other is the uh, uh, very slick, but kind of hard to know what's going on path. Um, and given the time that we have, um, I'm choosing the second one because it's uh, 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 easier. Um, and it's going to be, everything's going to be concrete, but, but it'll just kind of seem a little bit mysterious, possibly, um, at, at first sight. Okay, so um, let's proceed. So we're going to proceed rather in the way that we have uh, up, up till this point, uh, and that is... Um, when we had just an interconnected mechanical system, what was one of the ingredients in the equations of motion? One of the ingredients in the equations of motion were interconnection forces between various bodies and themselves and various bodies and the external world, right? So there were um, external forces and there were interconnection forces. Okay. So previously, we had external forces and interconnection forces. Okay, and you know, the kind of, and so I'm going to uh, now consider a different kind of force and I'm gonna call it a constraint force. Okay, <clears throat> and these are going to be uh, forces that um, maintain the linear velocity constraint in the same way that interconnection forces maintained the interconnection, okay? Um, and when I talked about interconnection forces, I uh, had a, a characterization of those. Uh, and the characterization of an interconnection force uh, at the end of the day, so let me just uh, maybe recall that since it's relevant here. Okay, so recall that the interconnection 
force torques. Okay, um, were such that the Lagrange force F associated with these. Satisfied. Okay. Um, F at um, uh, Q um, uh, um, yeah, I'll just leave it like that. Um, Okay, so um, when you calculate the forces and torques, uh, uh, you're really not thinking about the fact that the, the bodies are interconnected. You're just taking the Newtonian force torque data and you're just converting it into uh, a, a capital F using the rules that we had. Um, and interconnection forces had this property uh, that um, they did no work on Right, and so this condition you should, it's really a power condition as, as we've seen, the work condition would involve an integral, but um, the common terminology is they do no work on allowable motions of the system, right? And so the allowable motions of the system are those that sit in Q, okay? And so the tangent vectors to those motions will be in the tangent space to Q, which we're thinking here of being a subspace of the tangent space to Q free, okay? All right, so now we're going to kind of do something that's analogous for constraint forces. And I think it's not um, uh, too difficult to imagine at this point what that's going to be, uh, is that we're going to additionally require um, uh, not just that they, uh, uh, not that they annihilate um, um, uh, things in here, uh, but that they annihilate uh, uh, things in um, DQ. Okay. All right. So, therefore, um, definition. So, let me try to say this a little bit carefully. Um, so, consider an interconnected mechanical system with M bodies uh, and configuration manifold. Uh, Q in Q free. Okay, all right. So you know the stuff about li linear uh, linear velocity constraints was really geometric. It wasn't necessarily attached to the notion of an interconnected mechanical system. Here we're really talking about something that's, that's really physical. So I need to. There has to be some physics. Okay, um, so suppose. we have a linear velocity constraint D. Okay. So um, a collection F A tau A in R3, sorry, R3, of uh, force torques, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna, on each body, there's gonna be a force and a torque, okay? Um, and I'm going to define what it means uh, for that force and torque to, um, uh, uh, to be a constraint force and torque, <clears throat> okay? Um, is a constraint uh, 
force torque. If, okay, the Lagrange force lambda, okay, so I'm going to call it lambda here, uh, satisfies um, that uh, lambda at Q uh, annihilates VQ. And this has to be true for every VQ um, in. DQ. Okay. So the constraint force torques, they do no work on the motions allowed by the linear velocity constraint. Okay. All right. Um, and so uh, uh, when I had uh, 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 interconnection force torques, and they gave rise to uh, and, uh, a Lagrange force, okay, which satisfied therefore um, that condition. Okay, one of this one of the things that happened in that case was uh, uh, that that those interconnection force torques did not show up in the equations of motion. Okay, um, but for constraint force torques, which only satisfy oops, um, a condition like this. Okay, those still might show up in the equations of motion. Okay, because uh, they satisfy a condition which isn't as strong as that. Okay, it's it's a weaker condition because it only has to vanish on things in DQ. Right. So a priori, um, it's possible that when I write down the equations of motion, these constraint forces are going to show up there. Okay, and so you have to include them in the equations of motion. All right. So therefore. Um, so uh, um, thus, um, the equations of motion for a um, an interconnected mechanical system with a linear velocity constraint um, d. Take the form okay so i'm going to get the forced geodesic equations just like before okay um and there's going to be possibly uh some external forces and i still have to include those Okay, and those might depend on um, t and gamma prime of t. Okay, so these are you know uh, uh, you know sort of user or physics specified forces like potential forces or uh, magnetic forces or things like that, right? So, um, but then I also need to add on a constraint force lambda. Okay. Okay, um, and so I left myself a little space here, and I did that for a reason, because these are not the whole equations of motion, um, because I have not included here uh, the requirement that the force, sorry, the, the motions must satisfy the velocity constraint. So I have to include that in my equations of motion. Okay. So those are now the equations of motion, All right? And they're not ordinary equations of motion, right? Um, uh, this is <clears throat> a differential equation, um, but this is not a differential equation. It involves a derivative, but it's really not a differential equation because you have to keep in mind um, that this differential equation is a second order differential equation. And so the uh, uh, states for the system are position and velocity, 
Okay, so velocity is one of the states. Okay, um, and so this is a constraint on the states. Okay, that the state uh, must uh, lie in uh, D. Okay, and so so these are not uh, differential equations. Uh, they are what's known as, and we've so we've seen these before when we looked at the general Euler-Lagrange equations. We saw in examples that the general Euler-Lagrange equations for a randomly chosen Lagrangian are not differential equations. They're differential algebraic equations. Okay, so these are. Um, D A E's. So this is the thing that people talk about. So this is a differential algebraic equation. Okay. Um, and you know, there's an existence theory, right, for ordinary differential equations. Uh, the existence theory for D A E's is quite a lot harder. Okay, uh, but it turns out that this particular DAE, okay, um, is nice enough that you can prove that it always has solutions uh, and th those solutions are unique. And the way that you do that is you can reduce this somehow to a differential equation, okay? Uh, and the way you do that is you use this equation to eliminate the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So this is. Um, so again, if you hearken back to first year, these are all things that you would, you've already done uh, uh, when you uh, wrote down equations in mechanics in first year. So these linear velocity constraints, um, uh, you no doubt had examples uh, in your uh, elementary mechanics courses of you know rolling things, right? Uh, and so you put forces on there that maintain the rolling constraint in like in that very simple disc rolling in a straight line example. Okay, and so you would have put in there a constraint force, and then when you wrote down the equations of motion for that thing, you would have eliminated the constraint force, right? So these are all things that you've kind of done in ad hoc way uh, for examples. Um, and so what we're going to do next time um, is we're going to do this in a systematic way. We're going to eliminate um, uh, the the constraint force lambda, uh, and then and and end up with uh, differential equations. Okay, so um, so that's what we'll occupy ourselves with for most of the last class.